I, I'm going to preach that to you, uh, to you out of John chapter 15. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to John chapter 15, verse 5. Say amen when you get there. Hallelujah. I, I had a word um, that, that was about the Apostle Paul, and I just felt the Lord called an audible on me the last moment. So I just shifted over to, to this word in John chapter 15. Does anybody know what an audible is? It's when you're in football and you change the play at the line of scrimmage. You just change it right away. Um, so we're, we're going to dive into this. The word of God says this in John chapter 15, verse 5. And this is Jesus giving a parable. He's giving an illustrated sermon. And back then there was a lot of um, olive trees and there was a lot of... Uh, vineyards and so he he says I am the vine you are the branches everybody say he's the vine okay so he's the vine we are the branches how many know a branch cannot survive without the vine how many know a, a branch when you cut it off from the vine there's no more life flowing to that branch any longer and we we can't produce life outside of him is what he's really saying you can't produce fruit with a branch that's on its own. It would be like if I took this, this flower right here and I cut a piece off and I held it out and I expected it to produce fruit. That would be foolish, right? Because I've disconnected it from life itself. And that is what Jesus is saying to us. He's saying that apart from me, when you choose to disconnect from me, and how many know that's pretty easy to do in our lives? I'll be the first to admit that. Can I get an amen? How many know it's pretty easy with the distractions, uh, maybe just with your family, everyday life? We, we can tend to disconnect from Jesus and not lean into prayer. We can tend to disconnect. We don't do it intentionally all the time, but we won't lean into the word because there's so much going on in our lives. Am I the only one? Okay, you're making me feel alone. I got scared for a minute. But... But Jesus is saying when we don't connect with him, the source, the, the nutrients, spiritually, the love, the joy, we're trying to pour out from an empty cup. Do you hear me this morning, church? How many know fathers and dads, we have a, a responsibility to love our children, to love our spouse. And when we choose not to pray, but try to love them, we're like that branch disconnected from the vine. We're pouring out from an empty cup. And we find ourselves wanting so badly to be who God's called us to be, but never being able to walk in that because we're not in prayer. That's what it looks like when he's saying, apart from me, you're the branch, I'm the vine, and apart from me, there's no life. Somebody say this, there's life in the vine. It's like even those that are going to work and, and you're, you're a mom or maybe you're a stay-at-home mom, whatever you do, there's no life being able to flow from you when God isn't flowing to us. How many know he flows to us and then through us? Somebody say he flows. I'm going to teach you how to rap this morning. Can I do that? Somebody say he flows to me. Then he flows through me. And that's what we have to remember, that he flows to me first. That if I get alone with the Lord in the morning and I seek you first, the kingdom of God, then he says all other things will be added then I can walk in the purpose that God's called me to walk in. Then I can be that dad that God's called me to be, that, that wife, that husband. I can do all that God's called me to do because I have first connected with Jesus. See, it's kind of prideful of us to think that we could walk in our God-given purpose without connecting with him, without touching hands with him. I heard a quote one time. It said, a week without prayer is a boast to God. We're thinking we can do it on our own. There's a story of a, of a baseball player that hit a, a, he hit a home run, an infield uh, home run, and he's running around the bases, and he finally makes it to home. The, the crowd's cheering, and he gets to home base, and he touches home base, and the umpire calls him out, and the whole crowd is confused. He's confused, and the umpire tells him, you forgot to touch first base. When you forget to touch first base and you go all the way around, he called them out. And that's how it is in the kingdom of God. First base for us is the presence of Jesus. 
First base for us is those first 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes of prayer and word of God in our lives. That's first base for us. And if we forget to touch first base when our day starts, and we can go all throughout the bases thinking we're doing good, but we might look back and say, was that really effective today? Did I really do anything? I might have been busy, but how many know there's a difference between being busy and effective? I don't know about you, but I've had those days where I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off, and I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy, but I'm not really effective because I didn't seek the Lord for direction. I, I don't know about you, but I want all of my steps to be ordered by God. I, if I walk into a room, I want to know that God led me there. If I speak a word, I want to know that, man, those words are impacting somebody that might have needed that today. But you see, we miss all of those assignments when we don't touch first base first. You miss assignments. You miss moments. Um, you miss strategy of what God wants you to do when you don't first encounter the presence of God. How many can agree that when we, when we touch the hem of his garment, when we have that moment with him, our days are different? Why? It's because he explains it right here. Very simple. He says, I'm the vine. You're not the vine. I'm the vine. You're the branches. And he says, the one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. Bears much fruit. So he's, now he's speaking about living a life that at the end of our life, we'd be able to look back and say, there was fruit that came forth from our life. There was fruit that came forth from the breath that he put in our lungs. I want you to imagine what the day will be like when you face the Lord one day. We all will have that day where we stand before the Lord and we give an account for our life. And he's going to ask us what, what we did with the life that he gave to us, the beautiful life that he gave to us. And I want to be able to say there was fruit that came forth from my life. You might be wondering, what are you talking about? How can fruit come, come out of my life? Well, Jesus is speaking about the fruits of the Spirit. What are the fruits of the Spirit? Can you say them with me? Love, joy, peace. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, right? So it's living a life where people can look at you and see there's something different about you from the rest of the world, especially in the day you and I live in because days have gotten darker and darker. As we get closer to the coming of Jesus, days get darker and darker. This is what the word of God tells us. So, but the thing is, as days get darker, Christians should be shining brighter and brighter and brighter because we have Jesus in our lives. We have a joy that can't be shaken. We have a peace that he says it surpasses understanding. So people look at us, they don't understand how we walk through trials and tribulation. Maybe you're going through family problems and there should be such a peace on your life that the world looks and says, how are they going through all of that and still have peace? In their heart how can they be walking through that financial situation how can they be walking through that family thing and they still have joy on their life how is because we've connected to the vine we've 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 touched first base and now our life it bears fruit we have a joy the Bible says this we're a part of a kingdom think about this scripture we are a part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken, right? How many know before Christ, our lives were easily shaken? Something gets, you get upset about something and you're like, oh, forget it, right? Something happens and you're, it's just, you're so easily shaken. Why? Because he's our rock. He's our foundation. He, he steadies everything. He, he brings the calm to the storm. And, and the word of God says, now we've been saved. You are a part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. That's why, that's why we read, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for, thou art with, for you are with me, God. So now that I know, I, he, he's saying the source of my boldness of walking through death is that I know the Lord is with me. 
So I shall fear no evil. Why? Because your rod and your staff comforts me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup runneth over. And then he says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. We could shout right there because he says, goodness and mercy follows me. It's like, it's like it tracks me down. I, I couldn't get away from his goodness and mercy if I wanted to. Because every time I think about where I am today, I think about where he brought me from. I think about how far I've come. I think about how I used to be depressed. I think about how I, I wasn't always who I am today. You weren't always who you are today. And sometimes you just need a little flashback to give you some gratefulness and thankfulness in your heart. I want to encourage you today to just take a moment to think back to the place where God first encountered you. And it wasn't, it wasn't a place that was blessed yet. Even if you had finances or even if you were rich and even if you had possessions, you still did not have the favor and the blessing and the love of God on your life yet. I can, you can talk to people all over the world right now that are wealthy people, but if they don't have Christ in their heart, you don't see a joy like you see on a born-again believer filled with the Holy Spirit, somebody that's touched first base, somebody that has, has been connected to the vine called Jesus. Right? So he says, the one who remains in me and I in him bears much fruit. For otherwise, apart from me, and he says, cut off from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. For those who speak Spanish, nada. Nothing. We, we can do nothing. He, he is making it simple for us that we need God. Somebody say, I need the Lord. We need the Lord. I remember what it was like without Christ in my life. I remember I had a God-sized hole in my heart. I remember I was chasing and searching for things to satisfy my soul, and they never could. Why? Because he says, apart from him, I could do nothing. I was just living. I was just drifting with the wind, no purpose. But Jesus came into my life, and he changed everything And then he says this, if anyone does not remain in me, okay, get ready, buckle up your seatbelt. Everybody just kind of put, put the seatbelt on real quick, right? Put the seatbelt on real quick. Put the baby seatbelt on. Just do the two clicks and then the bottom clicks. Because this part is, it's a little hard to receive, especially now because I think we live in a world where people don't want to understand the consequences for not connecting with Jesus. But we have a responsibility in the church to preach the gospel in its fullness, right? We have a responsibility to talk to you not only about the love and the blessings of God, but also talk to you about eternity and what happens when we choose not to connect with Jesus. And Jesus makes it very clear here that there is a consequence for not connecting with him. He says, if anyone does not remain in me, he's thrown out like a broken off branch and withers and dies. And they gather such branches and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Let's, let's just let that sink in for a moment, that this is what Jesus is telling us, that we can't think if we choose to not connect with him and not have him in our lives, we can't think that it's going to be all okay. He says, those branches are gathered and thrown into the fire. He's speaking about hell. He's speaking about eternity in hell. But thank God that hell wasn't created for God's people. Thank God he didn't create that place for us. Thank God that God created a place for us with him. Eternity with him. But it does take us receiving the gospel. Come on, somebody. It does take us believing on Christ. It does take us receiving that he forgave our sins and believing that he forgave our sins when he died on the cross for us. 
It's a choice as well, right? Can I get an amen? Somebody say, it's a choice. And so he's telling us here to make the right choice because your eternity depends on it. Me and Pastor Josh were talking yesterday about different people in our family that we're, we're talking about how we want people to know God in our family. And, and we're talking about those that don't know the Lord really yet. And we have the same struggle. Pastor Josh was telling me, I try to present that message to my family, but I also don't want to push them away because I'm talking about it so strongly. And I have that same issue. But the thing is, is I want them so badly to understand that the choice of Jesus is the most important choice they will ever make in their life. That, that making a choice to believe in Christ and serving him, their eternity depends on it. And so this should really give us an urgency in our lives, right? Because eternity is on the line. I want to tell you a stat that I read. I, 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 wanted, I was interested to hear how many people in, in America actually still believe in eternity and, and believe in hell specifically. I was just curious. And I actually read four in ten adults in the United States believe that they can go to heaven without believing in God. So four in ten, we're, we're almost that, that's almost at 50%. So we're in a scary place that almost 50% of Americans believe that one day they're going to make it into heaven, but, they, but have no connection with him here on earth. How scary is that thinking that I could believe that one day I'm going to go into the kingdom of heaven? It would be like you coming to my house one day. I've never seen you, and I've never had a relationship with you. And you knock on my door, and I come to the front, and I have my kids in my door, right? I have my family. And you just say, let me in. How many, how, what are you going to say? All the men of God say? Yes. No. You might even, some of you might even came to the door with your shotgun. <laughs> just because you don't recognize the person, right? Some of you might not even answer. You might have just did the ch -ch -ch, Just let them hear it real quick. And then answered the door so they know, right? But it's foolish for people. For us to think that we can not connect with God, but one day reap the benefits of God. That, that we, we cannot spend time with him, but one day spend eternity with him. Right? And, and we even do that maybe in a mild way in our everyday lives too. We want to claim the promises of God, but not spend time in the presence of God. One of my favorite things is when my, my daughters, they, they will tell me that they love me, and the first thing I say is, okay, wh what do you want? <laughs> you know, because they tell me they love me at the toy store all the time. I don't know what happens. They just got a love anointing on their life. When they walk in the toy store, they just feel the love of God. <laughs> and so, but one of my favorite things is the other night, my, my oldest daughter, Winter, she, she lay down in the bed with me, and I, I, sometimes I lay with them, and she just said, Daddy, I love you. And I said, I love you too. And she just said, you're, you're the best dad in the world. And I almost started crying right there because I was just so blessed that there was no hidden motive, that she was just, she was just taking a moment to, to love me. And I, and I believe that with the Lord, when we come to him with no hidden motive, or agenda, and we just say, Lord, Father, I love you. I praise you. I just believe it brings pleasure to the heart of God. And so I, I think that we have to understand that we have to connect with God in order to see his promises in our life. And I think we have to understand that when we don't connect with God, there, there are consequences. The Bible says the wages. Somebody say wages. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. It's saying that wages are owed to somebody. You, wages, you can't get away from wages. I remember I, I worked at a shoe store, my first job, and I got a check one day in the mail three years after I worked at that shoe store. 
Has that ever happened to you? I, I, I got a check in the mail and I got so excited. I'm like, they must owe me a lot of money. You know how much my check was? My wages. I'm talking about wages. My wages were 0.3 cents. It costed them more to send me that check than my check itself. I was so confused, but because they're a corporation, they have to give me that, those three minutes or those five minutes that I clocked in for work, they had to make sure those wages got to me. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death, which means there is a consequence and they will find you out. We, we can't think that we can live however we want and we can live opposed to God's word and not have any wages coming towards us. I know this is, I know this is hard to wrestle with. I, I have to wrestle with this when I read this. But we have to receive this part of the word of God. But the good thing is that we don't have to live with sin in our life. God didn't create us for that. God created us for victory, to overcome. God wants us to walk in victory and overcome sin, and we could do all that, and we could have the blessings and the favor of God on our life when we choose Jesus, right? How many want to choose Jesus? I like that a lot more. Do you like that a lot more? I like that a lot more. The devil's desire, especially as I travel the United States and preach, I see that the devil's desire is to convince young people that their sin doesn't have consequences. Or let me just say it more simply, is to convince young people that if they don't connect with Jesus, they're just fine. I see it all over. Sometimes I preach at youth conferences and I have to almost beg. It's like pulling teeth. How many, how many parents here, it's like pulling teeth sometimes to tell them to make their bed or to tell them to clean their, it's like when I preach, I feel like I'm trying to get them to understand. And, and the, the attitude is, it's not a big deal. Some of them believe I'll serve God when I'm older, not knowing that tomorrow is promised to nobody and that today is the day of salvation and, and that most of all, if they give their hearts to the Lord right now, listen to me, young people in here, if you give your hearts to the Lord right now, you don't ever have to experience the heartache of the world, the heartache that the enemy wants you to experience. You, you, I want, you know what I want my, my daughter's and my kid's testimony to be? Is not, not just what Jesus saved them from, but I want it to be what Jesus kept them from. I, I want them to know that Jesus, you don't ha ever have to go and experience. And, and you know what's crazy is some people will tell me and Celeste, we're, we're strict in our parenting and what we let them watch and, and how we let them, you know, what we, what we allow into our home. And I've heard people say, well, don't you think they're going to miss out? Miss out on what? Miss out on depression, miss out on pain, miss out on all the, the, the vices that the enemy brings through, through uh, different movies. And the, the devil is crafty. He uses electronics and he, he could use all these things. But I want to live a life where my kids do miss out on everything the devil has for them. But they're able to lean into everything that Jesus has for them. Come on, somebody. Let me tell you, young people, from somebody who lived it. From, from the age I was 16 years old, for years I was bound in drugs. I was out there with the parties. I was doing the high school thing and all of the things you can imagine that are the cool stuff. Let me tell you something. You're not missing out on nothing to all the young people in here. Jesus was the greatest decision I ever made. And if I could go back, I would have never dabbled in any of that because all it ever did was bring destruction. All it ever did, the Bible says the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus, when he came into my life, he gave life and life more abundantly. I wish I could go back and never even have, but you know what? God saved me at a young age. And when, when I got saved at that age of 16 and, I, and my heart changed, I realized that this is actually where the real party is. Come on, somebody. There's a, there's a song my mom used to sing. It used to say, ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party because a Holy Ghost party don't stop. She used to tell me that all the time. And when I got saved, I actually, it was funny, I had like a revelation that that song she sang to me over the years actually was real. 
because I got saved and I, I went from partying in the world and nothing ever came of that life. And then I got saved and I was like, wow, here in church, lifting my hands, feeling the presence of God, feeling his joy. Do you guys remember when you first gave your heart to the Lord that you opened? I was like, wow, there ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party. Because a Holy Ghost party don't stop. Because sin is temporary and the pleasures of this world are quickly fading. And you constantly have to, you constantly are chasing another high, another moment. But Jesus, that Holy Ghost party doesn't stop. I wake up and his goodness is on my life. I go to sleep, I feel his blessing on my life. It's not always perfect, but I can tell you it's worth it. Amen? Amen. So what should this do when we hear about the consequence? When we hear about there, there is a decision to be made? I wrote down it should, be, it should put the church into a state of urgency. There should be a, a passion in our heart to tell somebody about the God that we serve because we know how vital this is. You don't know how, how far it can go, how, what, what it could do for somebody that you just share the gospel with, that you just invite over maybe for some food and you invite them into your, your life and you start to share the, the goodness of God in their life. I, I preached a message in, in the Bay Area and there was a brother that came to the altar and he was crying and then he came up to me after and he, he was crying. He just said, I just want to tell you your message about surrendering to God. I spoke about surrendering to God. I spoke about those that want to serve God, but they always have a, a, they always have a backup plan and they always run to that backup plan. And I basically spoke about surrender and he said, I want you to know today, my brother, that my backup plan has always been Alcohol. I serve God, but then when things don't go well, I run back to alcohol. But he said, you spoke today about fully surrendering. Fully surrendering. There's nothing like when you fully surrender. And he said, I'm never going back. He told me that. He said, I'm never going back. He said, I cut the lifeboat. I cut off the, the backup plan, and now I'm going to stick fully surrendered. Let me tell you, a year later, I went to his church to preach at his church. And this, this man who had no involvement in church really besides just coming and he would struggle a lot, he was actually the head usher of the church. And not only was he the head usher, but he was actually the one that took up the tithes and the offering. And not only that, but he was the, the armor bearer for the pastor. And I was just watching. I was like, wow, you just never know what it could do for somebody when they actually catch it. So, so it's important, like I'm a fisherman, Brother Andy, are we fishermen? So it's important to cast out the line. How many know if we never cast out the line to the world that's, that's, that's lost, that there's never an opportunity to see people come into the kingdom? So I encourage you, family, when you're going to work, cast out the line. I encourage you that when you're at school, young people, cast out the line. Yes, sometimes you might be rejected, but it's okay. That's why, he, that's why the, the word of God says that he's the one who comforts us. He's the, why would he send the comforter, the Holy Spirit, if we were never called to be uncomfortable? Some of y'all caught that right there. Why would we have the comforter if we were never called to be uncomfortable? I know it's uncomfortable to tell somebody, hey, can I just talk to you real quick and just tell you that God loves you? Has anybody ever told you that God loves you, that God has a plan for your life? Can I pray with you for a second? I know it makes everybody uncomfortable. But it's okay, you got the comforter, you got the Holy Spirit. And when you cast that line out, you just don't know. You don't know that person that's been searching. You don't know that person that's been asking for a sign. You don't know that person that might have just gone through a crisis in their life and they've been saying, Lord, if you're real, send somebody. And you're there casting your line out. And there, I'm telling you, you will see God move in people's life. They might come to church with you but it's important that we are in a state of urgency to cast that line out, amen? And it should per, put the non-believer into a state of emergency. I wrote that as well. The non-believer should say, what, what must I do to be saved? This is the last part I want to share with you. It's in John chapter 15, verse 7. And this is the part that 
shows the heart of God and what he desires for our lives. How many want to know what God desires for your life? He says, this is the reward of remaining in me. There's, there's a consequence for not remaining in me. And then he says, but there's a reward for remaining in me. There's a, there's a blessing for when you connect with me. There's a blessing for when, for when you remain in me. He says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, that is, if we are vitally united and my message lives in your heart, how many want to be vitally united with God? Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified and honored by this. When you bear much fruit, improve yourselves to be my disciples. I have loved you just as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. If you keep my commandments, listen to this. Every young person in here, I want to just take a moment to, to read this part to you. If you keep my commandments and obey my teaching, that means if you disregard what the world is telling you to do, disregard what friends are telling you to do, he's saying if you obey my word, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that my joy and delight may be in you and that your joy may be full. Let that just settle in for a second. The reward for following God, the reward for following his word, the reward for staying close to Jesus is that your joy may be full in him, that, that his joy may be full in you and that his love may be full in you. That's what he desires for your family. That's what he desires in your everyday life. I remember I had a false sense of joy in the world before God. It wasn't, it wasn't a full joy. It was a false joy, and it was a half joy. But Jesus, he says, I come that your joy may be full, that you, you may be overflowing with love in your life, overflowing with his blessing on your life, his goodness. That's what he's saying he desires for us. That's why he's called the bread of life. How many know he's called, the, he says, I'm the bread of life. He fills us. He satisfies us like no other relationship can. I love my wife. I love my children. But if I didn't have my relationship with Jesus, I would be lacking. And I would feel, I would feel Void and empty because Jesus is the only one that satisfies. Right? He's the bread of life. He fills. How many know bread fills? Have you ever been to Olive Garden? <laughs> they're, they're strategic in how they serve you their food. Right? You go to Olive Garden. You there and you see the menu, you see the chicken parmesan, you see the Alfredo, right? You got, come on, you guys know what I'm talking about. You're making me feel like, you, you're making me feel like, I'm, you know, I'm the only one. And I look at the menu and I'm like, let me get the chicken parmesan, you know, throw some, just you do it. And then they bring out these demonic breadsticks, <laughs> right? Straight from the pits of hell itself. And they put it on the table, and they, I don't know what they do, but they even shine them. They look shiny. <laughs> like, you can't, you can't resist the breadsticks even if you wanted to. And you already ordered your meal, right? You're getting ready. You're like, I got my food coming, but let me just take one. And then one turns to two. And then two turns to three. Then you order, like, can I have some more? Because you know they're endless, right? <laughs> How many know the love of God is like that? His, it's endless. He'll pour his love out on your life to you where you're so satisfied and full. And then your food comes, and this is what it's like serving the Lord. I'm just going to give you a little picture. Your food comes, your entree, and you realize, I'm not even hungry for that. Because I've been so filled with the bread. And I've realized that's how it is with Jesus. That when 
the enemy comes and serves me a plate or he tries to tempt me and bring something, a distraction, I've been so filled with the love of God. I've been so filled with his presence and he satisfied me so much that I can look at sin, I can look at the temptation and I could say, I don't even desire that because he has satisfied me with every good and perfect thing that I could ever need in my life. Right? Maybe the reason why you've been reaching for other things is because you haven't been letting him satisfy you in the presence. Maybe the reason why you when temptation comes, you give in, is because you haven't let him become the bread of life in you. You haven't let him fill you up. You might be, maybe you say, I'm, I go to church though. I'm not talking about that. Church attendance is great. I'm talking about an actual relationship with the Lord. If I told my wife, babe, I love you so much, but uh, Sundays will be the only day I talk to you. My wife's Puerto Rican, so I, you guys would have to put me on that prayer list. <laughs> You'd be like, pray for Pastor Z, you know? But sometimes we could treat our relationship with God like that, and, and it's a form of godliness. I'm happy you're here, but this isn't it. This isn't it. This is just the fuel. This is, we're called to just be a little a little fuel for you, and then when you go home with the Lord, you're encountering him in your everyday life. And my friend, I, I'll, I'll go as far as saying, if you're not doing that, you're missing out. If you're relying on this to be everything in your life, just what pastor preaches to you once a week, and that's what you know, there is a word for you on Monday morning. There is a word for you on Tuesday morning. There's a blessing. God wants to walk with you on Wednesday. God wants to go to Walmart with you on Thursday. God wants to go to the store with you. He wants to drink coffee. He wants to be there with you while you're drinking coffee. And he wants that fellowship. And that's the only way we'll ever be satisfied and filled in our lives. How many want to tap into that? I think this message that I'm giving right now is taking a little bit of, of a turn, but I think it's for somebody. That somebody needs to tap into more, an overflow. We're not running on just enough no more. Just enough, it's like we do a separation without noticing it. And what it really is at its core is religion. It's like, okay, I, yeah, I do, I, but now it's like, no, I want God to walk, I want to walk with God day in, and day out. Amen?